This class is um, kind of wide ranging. We're going to talk about a, a lot of refrigeration stuff. We're not going to cover like really small refrigeration systems, um, like pump down systems, but Corey and I have some good, good stuff coming here shortly. When I say Corey and I, it's mostly Corey, but um, good, good 3D video that we're going to be making on that, actually already working on that. Uh, but this class is uh, kind of for folks who work in big retail. Uh, all the stuff you kind of need to know if you really don't have a, a background in it. Um, but for those of you who are like, all right, I'm going to check out. This isn't for me. This has got stuff in there that's really for for anybody who wants to understand more about the basics of how things get made cold and hot and uh, ventilated, which is sort of what we do here. So to start with, I want to introduce a couple of folks who are going to be on the mic here uh, as they have stuff to share. Um, Corey Cruz, a uh, market refrigeration tech all around. Good guy. I saw you wave. Uh -huh. um, Hi, it's Corey. A lot of you probably already know Corey. Chad Manier, um, another uh, kind of lead refrigeration HVAC guy working in the market and retail space. Uh, Christian Maitland. Christian, I don't know what do you, what do you what do you go by? Like, what's the title for you? Same thing, refrigeration tech. Yeah, yeah refrigeration service tech. And uh, I'm sure Bert won't be able to keep his mouth shut at some point, and all of you already know him. So, am I allowed to talk? What? Allowed to start talking? I mean, we'll Do I see. Have to raise my hand? We'll see how it goes. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. To start with, we're going to go over just some some basics that everybody everybody's familiar with if you do this sort of thing. But it's always good to good to cover it. Um, it's one of the first things that I learned whenever I. Went to HVAC school and maybe write it over and over again on the board. This is an illustration that's widely available that we created um, and kind of kind of covers the basics. So to start with evaporator, um, I prefer to call it the boilerator. <laughs> the evaporator's job is to absorb heat. That's what it does. Picks up heat. Uh, in the case of refrigeration, it picks up heat from product cases. Um, in the case of air conditioning, it's picking up heat from the air that's traveling over it from the return side uh, intake into the home. And the reason it can uh, remove so much heat from the air, so again, it's absorbing heat, so it's removing heat from the air, and that's the process of cooling, removing heat. The reason it can remove so much by volume is uh, of the refrigerant, of the fluid, is because that fluid that we call a refrigerant is changing state. So it's changing state from liquid to vapor, and in that process, it's able to absorb a lot of additional heat. We're not going to go into a ton about that, but that's the, that's the basic. So I always call the evaporator the heat absorber. The compressor um, is the uh, pressure increaser. So its job is to take low pressure gas that's coming back from the evaporator coil and increase its pressure. And in the process, you'll see that you have uh, vapor or gas coming into it uh, at a very low temperature and a very low pressure with a large line. And it comes out at a very high pressure and a high temperature with a smaller line. And the reason that happens is because you're taking molecules and you're jamming them together. You're taking molecules that we're kind of moving slowly, just floating through space, and you jam them suckers together, and so uh, they get a lot more jiggly. So when you think about temperature, temperature is a measurement of how jiggly the molecules are. When they're mashed together, they move a lot faster. If you want to be real fancy about that, you say the average molecular velocity. That's what temperature is. It's a measurement of the average molecular velocity, which just means that uh, higher temperature stuff means that the molecules are jiggling a lot faster, and lower temperature stuff means they're jiggling slower. So comes out of the evaporator coil, they, they, they are, uh, they're less packed together, and so they jiggle less, and then we throw it in the compressor, compressor jams them together, increases the pressure, and it comes out as a very high temperature um, gas. Goes into the condenser. Condenser's job is to reject heat. So uh, we're, we're generally, in most of the systems we work on, it's rejecting heat to the outside air. Um, but in some cases like self-contained systems, it may be rejecting it to the inside space or in the case of water cooled systems, uh, it may be rejecting heat into water or some sort of other secondary fluid. A metering device is what I call the pressure dropper, uh, pressure decreaser, if you prefer to not use the dropper word. Um, and its job is to reduce the pressure, uh, on liquid refrigerant. Uh, again, I didn't really mention this a condenser, but obviously a condenser, not only does it uh, reject heat out, evaporate absorbs it in, condenser rejects it out, but it also changes state once again. It changes it from a vapor to liquid, and that's why it's called a condenser. And it does literally go into the top as a vapor, 
it, and it changes state and then comes out the bottom as a liquid. So if you pay attention, you'll notice that evaporator coil, coils are fed from the bottom. And so it starts as liquid and ends up vapor in the top and condensers are fed from the top, starts as, uh, starts as vapor and then ends up liquid as the bottom, goes up the liquid line, it goes to that pressure dropper or metering device, which then allows that refrigerant to boil once again, uh, which now absorbs more heat in that evaporator coil. People who get really confused by this idea of boiling, you think of boiling as being, you know, boiling is always boiling hot, right? Well, that's just because we're used to water boiling at 212 degrees, but actually uh, boiling water is actually absorbing heat from the burner. So it's actually picking up heat and then rejecting it into the, into the space as that water leaves. In the case of a closed loop system, the, the part that does the boiling is the part that's actually cooling what's around it. And the part that does the condensing is the part that's actually heating what's around it. Go ahead, Bert. Okay, fine. All right, you got me. I just want to point out that the names of these four major components are what they do. Like the work that's being done. Uh -huh. yeah, it, it, it's often something that could be easily overlooked, but like really helpful for anybody new who's trying to learn it. Like you start memorizing the names of these things. And that one day when you finally connect to like, whoa, that's actually their job. Like the name of the thing is its job. So. Right. Honestly, yeah. that's genius. Yeah. I never even put that together. That changes my whole outlook. Yeah, it changes everything, uh, yeah. which is why Bert's title at Kalos is the annoying guy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> says that right in his, right in his business cards. Uh, yes, right. good point. Good point. Yes. Right. Evaporator right. evaporates, compressor compresses, condenser condenses, metering device meters. Uh, and a lot of you may not even experience text. You may not hear a metering device a lot, but a metering device is a, a couple different common types. So TXVs, electronic expansion valves, um, pistons, capillary tubes, a lot of different types of uh, standard metering devices. But their job, hand valves. Uh, <laughs> yes, no. yes. In case of the manually set metering device. But again, it's always taking a higher pressure coming in and it's metering it to a lower pressure coming out. So it's decreasing pressure um, and it's resulting in that evaporation again in the evaporator coil. Some simplified principles here that are always worth covering. Um, energy is neither created nor destroyed. So we're kind of summarizing some of uh, New Newton's laws and some of the laws of thermodynamics. So energy is neither created or destroyed. We're just moving heat around. That's all we're doing. So heat is a form of energy and we're just moving it around. Heat moves from hot to cold or higher temperature to lower temperature. And that's really key because when we say hot to cold, um, we're not talking about total heat content. We're talking about temperature. And the best example I can give is if you think about a swimming pool versus a coffee mug. Um, the swimming pool may be, you know, 70 degrees. And you'd say if you jump in that swimming pool, it'd be like, oh, it's cold. And your coffee mug uh, may be, you know, 100 degrees, 120 degrees, whatever it is. And you would say, well, that's hot. But which of those two actually contain more heat in the fluid? So in the, in the liquid, which contain more heat? Well, the swimming pool actually has more heat because it has a lot more water in it, right? So overall, the heat content of a swimming pool uh, is much more significant than the heat content of a coffee mug. If you take that coffee mug at 120 degrees, 130 degrees, and you splash it into the pool, it's not going to change the temperature of that pool at all, even though it's a much higher temperature. So when we talk about heat, it's always important to know, are we talking about units of heat? That would be BTUs, British Thermal Units, which is the overall amount of heat, or are we talking about the intensity, which is temperature? And again, we already, already mentioned temperature is average molecular velocity, which just means how fast are the molecules shaking inside of uh, inside of that uh, substance. And so that's actually what we're measuring with a thermometer. We're actually measuring the average speed that those molecules are, are vibrating inside that substance. Um, you're not really, you're not making cold, you're just removing heat. Exactly. You know, you're not making anything cold, you're moving heat around, and there really is no such thing as cold. Um, some people will point out, well, yeah, there's absolute zero, which I think is negative 490, something like that. I never remember what it is. And that is the point at which it can't get any colder. Mm -hmm. Um, but cold is not a that you can't measure units of cold. We measure units of heat uh, or the absence thereof of heat. So we're really just uh, we're really just moving heat around. That's all we're doing. Solids, liquids, and gases, those are our states of matter. Um, in a air conditioning refrigeration system, we really don't like solids. Um, we see it sometimes when we allow our evaporator coils to get a uh, low enough temperature that uh, ice builds up on them, but that is not a design feature unless you're working on an ice machine. But we also see it uh, in some rare cases if we work on CO2 systems, and we allow the pressure to drop low enough uh, below that uh, triple point, and now it becomes solid inside the system. So that's a that's another kind of bad thing. Um, you'll notice it, it kind of uh, talks about the different types of heat here. It's, you'd have to really zoom in to see what it says here, but you have latent heat effusion, 
Um, that's the heat that goes for it to change something from liquid to solid or solid to liquid. Uh, gas to liquid, you have latent heat of vaporization if it goes from liquid to gas and liquid latent heat of condensation if it goes from gas to liquid. And then you have the latent heat of sublimation, which is when something changes directly from a solid uh, to, a liquid, to a vapor or a vapor to a solid. That's what we see with CO2. CO2 has kind of that weird property at low pressure where it does that. Uh, and in the past, we wouldn't really care, but actually nowadays we work on quite a few CO2 systems where CO2 is being used as the heat transfer medium is being used as the refrigerant. Well, um, is, is plasma not, not a state of matter? Well, okay, well, this is actually an interesting, all right, interesting point. There are actually indefinite states of matter. Um, when we say when we say something has a particular state of matter, we're we're saying it has some properties that we combine together and we give it a name, but there are actually tons of different states of matter that we don't list here. Um, when we're talking about uh, fluids that we traditionally use for um, air conditioning and refrigeration, these are the big boxes um, that we that we place them in. But uh, yeah, you, when you get things that are really high temperature, really high pressure, really low temperature, uh, really low pressure, you get all kinds of crazy states of matter that exist within that. I heard a physicist talk about this one time that really everything that we're uh, calling different states of matter are really just simplifications uh, that make it easier for us to understand. But there's essentially indefinite d indefinite states that you could say, well, this slight property changes or that slight property changes. You can also get solids in um, some some refrigerants similar like CO2, um, uh, glycol, you know, they have like burst pressures and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So you can get them inside the wine. Yeah, good point. It, especially when you're working with a secondary fluid, I mean, water yeah. being uh, one of the most common secondary fluids we ever work with, meaning that you're using water. Um, so just to be clear what we're saying, in many cases, we take refrigerant and we uh, expand it in the evaporator coil, we evaporate it, uh, boil it, whatever you want to say. And that's how we absorb heat. But sometimes we'll use an evaporator coil or heat exchanger and we will cool another fluid and then we'll take that fluid and pump it around and it doesn't actually necessarily change state when that fluid is water obviously you have to be careful not to freeze it you you really got to be careful with that um obviously if it freezes it expands um water and, and a few other uh liquids actually create a crystalline structure when they when they become a solid and so they actually uh, expand and converse things so you got to be really careful with that as well how do these thermodynamic principles apply to refrigerants i don't like to i don't like to uh read slides too much, but this is basically, you know, just a definition of some things. So when we take air conditioning is basically, and really when we say air conditioning, the original definition um, was really comes from Willis Carrier. Willis Carrier started using that term air conditioning. And I think he defined it as the simultaneous control of temperature, humidity, and filtration, I think is uh, the three that he named. But we can really say, you know, it's when we say AC, we're usually talking about the cooling process. Um, but conditioning the air really could mean a, a wide variety of things, but we generally just mean cooling. And so generally speaking, when we're using these types of systems that we're talking about that utilize compression refrigeration and evaporative coils, uh, we're absorbing heat from inside the structure and we're rejecting it outside the building in order to make the, the temperature of the structure inside a lower temperature. In the case of refrigeration, we're doing a similar thing. We're just picking up heat from product, picking up heat from inside of a case, and then we're rejecting it somewhere else. In the case of a self-contained product, obviously, or self-contained case um, that's inside of a store, think of a soda machine. Uh, and you are you know, rejecting heat from those, those cans of soda inside the machine. You're rejecting it to the space around it, So, which in most cases would be inside the store. What makes a refrigerant a good refrigerant is that it can uh, change phases and reject a lot of heat in doing so. And we call that Typically, we call that the latent heat of vaporization. So when we look at what makes a good refrigerant a good refrigerant, we say, how much heat does it absorb and reject per pound uh, within that kind of target design temperature range? And so really good refrigerants um, that we've used for a long time would be like R22, R410A, you know, those, those sorts of uh, refrigerants. Um, R12 being one that was originally uh, used in in refrigeration. As we've gone on, sometimes we've had to make sacrifices, but sometimes we don't. For example, ammonia is an amazing, has pretty much the highest uh, heat of vaporization that uh, latent heat of vaporization of any refrigerant that we work on still used today in ice rinks and things like that. Um, downside, of course, is that, uh, you know, it'll kill you. Um, CO2 has great, great latent heat of vaporization, but it has this challenge of you got to kind of keep it in this particular range of temperatures and pressures in order for it to be effective. Uh, propane has amazing latent heat of vaporization, uh, better even than R22 with the same pressures, but again, you know, kind of explosive. So 
we always have to think about you know the safety of a refrigerant, its latent heat of vaporization, how well it carries oil. Uh, we've changed the oils with modern refrigerants because of that, because we want to make sure that that oil circulates with modern refrigerants that don't carry traditional oils as well as the old ones did. Uh, but those are the things that we rely on with uh, uh, with a good refrigerant. Those are the characteristics. Um, and then temperature pressure relationships. So this is a really common one, and this is and this is actually uh, fairly universal. So as pressure increases, temperature increases, and as pressure decreases, temperature decreases. Now, a lot of people will say, well, yeah, that's true when you're changing phase. So in an evaporator coil, you know, we drop the pressure, and so it begins to begins to evaporate, and that's when we pick up a lot of heat. But it's actually true universally. So if you take even something that's just vapor and you drop its pressure, its temperature is also going to decrease. In fact, the very first ice machine or very first refrigeration machine, again, it's this is disputed territory, but we're from Florida, so we like to credit John Gorey as being the inventor of uh, refrigeration, used essentially air and water. It didn't use a true refrigerant that changed state, but just through compressing and decompressing, pressurizing and depressurizing, you could absorb and reject heat. Um, without a phase change. We use phase changes nowadays, changing from liquid to vapor in order to move more heat. But pretty much universally, you decrease pressure, you're going to decrease temperature. You increase pressure, you're going to increase temperature. Comments? Anybody? No. All right. You nailed it. I, yeah. Uh, no, I do want to say, though, uh, a thing that you said a while back and, you know, how they came up with the term, you know, like one ton. Oh. Uh, <laughs> way back in the day. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, actually, that's, yeah, that is a, a kind of a fun thing to think about. So when we talk about BTUs, BTUs, 12,000 BTUs per hour, um, or what is that? That's uh, 288,000 BTUs per 24-hour period. Somebody can do the math real quick and see if that's right. 12,000 times 24, that sounds right. Where that came from was when they initially were uh, designing refrigeration systems. One of the very first uh, applications for that was to uh, be able to cool product in refrigerated boxcars. And so when you would send meat or you would send any sort of perishable uh, across the country, you would have to pack it in blocks of ice. And you'd pack it together with blocks of ice and sawdust usually is what they would use as an insulator and you'd send it across the country. Well, when this uh, compression refrigeration first came out and they had to design them, they would say, all right, well, how big do I need to make this thing? Uh, how, 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 big, how big do I need to make it in order to cool the product? And they would say, well, before we used to use three tons of ice. And so, okay, so I need to make it three tons worth. Uh, and that's where we, that's why we still use that today. So literally a, a ton of cooling capacity, whether it's refrigeration, air conditioning, whatever it is, that 12,000 BTUs per hour, or like I said, I think it's 288, whatever it is, um, times 24, uh, that 24 hour period, that's the same as it would, as a block of ice would take uh, or absorb in completely melting. So I'm going from a 32 degree, one ton block of ice to 32 degree completely melted water um that is one ton of equal to one ton of refrigeration and that's where it comes from a little fun history lesson but a lot of things are very simple like that um like when you think about uh, american wire gauge like we say number 12 wire you know like well where did that come from why is it number 12 wire well that actually started out as fencing wire so when they would do fencing, they would say number 12, that's how they rated fencing wire. And so you just get wire that was the same size as what you would use for a fence. And that's how that started. Because actually some of the very first distribution electrical uh, that was used in the in the country was actually just running it along fences. That's how you'd do it. If you wanted to get electricity from here to there, you already had a fence. So to wire up and fire up. <laughs> Them's was the good old days, let me tell you. When you could electrocute someone, and not blink an eye. Yeah. I'm just kidding. That's not, we don't want to electrocute people. I don't want you to get that idea. Um, at least not usually. All right, the lines, we talked about this a little bit already. So each line is named between the components. So your suction line, um, we'll start with that, moves between the evaporator and the compressor. So it moves that cool superheated vapor from the evaporator cool to the compressor. And when we say superheated, once again, everybody freaks out, just like when we say it boils in the evaporator coil and they expect it to be hot because we think boiling's hot and they find out it's cold. It's like, what's going on here? What's wrong with the language? It's because we're used to water. And when we hear superheated, that sounds, oh man, that must be super hot. But the air around us is superheated. Superheated just means that it's a vapor that has increased in temperature above its boiling point. In the case of air, well, of course, what's the boiling point of air? I don't even know. It's really cold. You know, it's like negative something, 200 something degrees. And so the air above us is highly superheated above its boiling point. In the case of refrigerant, we're just saying if it's superheated, that means it's completely boiled. In other words, there's no liquid left. It's completely vapor. 
So when we say the suction line moves cool, so it's still low temperature to touch, um, superheated vapor from the evaporator to the compressor, that's what we're saying. We're not saying it's super hot to touch, we're saying it's heated above its boiling point. Discharge line goes between our compressor and our condenser. Again, it's still vapor. Compressors are vapor in, vapor out, unless you want them to blow apart on you. Um, so very hot superheated vapor from the compressor into the top of that condenser. Then it goes through that condenser, desuperheats, begins to condense until it's fully liquid at the bottom. And the liquid line is going to move warm to touch subcooled liquid from the condenser to the metering device. So the liquid line better be full of liquid. That's what it's supposed to have in it. Um, and that's going to move, and that liquid line transports that liquid um, to the metering device. Uh, again, we're going to talk about receivers here in a couple more slides. Uh, in market refrigeration, it would go to the receiver before it goes to the metering device. Uh, superheat, again, we already talked about that. It's just the temperature of a vapor above the saturation temperature, and subcooling is just the temperature of a liquid below the saturation temperature. In other words, if something is subcooled, if it has, if its temperature is below its condensing temperature, that just means it's liquid. That's what we're using that measurement for, and superheated, that just means it's vapor. All right, so we got some other uh, things that we kind of add in. These are some of our basic accessories that you see, you know, regularly. Um, the receiver basically is a tank for liquid. So rather than it coming out of the condenser and going straight into the metering device, you have this receiver in between, which acts as a storage tank. And this is especially important in systems that don't have consistent load on them. So uh, especially cases like grocery stores where you've got multiple evaporative coil coils and you don't know, you know, how much is going to be operating at one time or how many will be in defrost, whatever you need to, to have some excess refrigerant to work with. Um, sight glass is just a way to kind of look into your liquid line um, and see, is it a full line of liquid? And this is uh, a shortcut that, that essentially has been used by um, lazy refrigeration techs forever because they don't like to measure cooling. But, uh, it, but it, is a, it is a good visual way to, to see whether it's a full liquid line. May I add? Oh, sorry. Something? Go ahead. Of course so you can. When, I first, when I first ever went to a refrigeration system, uh, the guy who was training me, he said, look at the sight glass and see if it's clear or if, if it's bubbling. I, I honestly, and I don't know if anybody else had this issue, but I was like, okay, it sounds simple, but I didn't know what I was actually looking at. And there's actually no difference between a clear sight glass and an empty sight glass. So I have seen where people are like, oh yeah, sight glass was clear. It should be working. And it's like, okay, would you put gauges on it? No. And it's actually empty. <laughs> so uh, it should, you should be able to see right through it. Yeah. So the point is, is that both vapor and liquid are both clear. And um, if it's full, that could mean that it's full, or it's full of liquid. It means you don't see bubbles. That's a better way of saying it. And rather than saying full, you say, is, are there bubbles or not? But you'll also, you won't get any bubbles if it's off completely too. So like, you know, it's, uh, it's a very uh, kind of narrow band of things that are going to, where you're really going to see bubbles. And that's when you have a functioning system, it's got refrigerant in it, but you don't have a full line of liquid and it's running, obviously. Uh, filter dryers, uh, filter dryers are commonly installed in both the liquid line and the suction line, um, kind of for different purposes. Your liquid line filter dryers generally tend to be there um, for operation purposes. They're going to catch things before they get into your metering devices or your screens, since it's very important that, you know, they keep, they keep that liquid line clean. Your suction line dryers, uh, filter dryers are there to protect the compressor and especially become important when the system has had massive amounts of contaminants in it. Uh, for those of you who kind of wonder why we don't have suction line dryers on more systems or why that's not uh, more regularly uh, used, when you use suction line dryers, uh, they produce a little bit of a pressure drop, even if it's just tiny, even when they're clean. And this comes down to some basics of moving heat around and how these systems work. We want to keep our compression ratios as low as possible. And when you hear, you know, oh, that's fancy talk compression ratio. What is that? It's very simple. It just means that if you take your, your discharge line pressure, so the, the pressure on, this, on the line coming out of your compressor, and you take your uh, suction line pressure coming into your compressor, you want those two to be as close together as you can. You don't want a lower suction pressure than you need, and you don't want a higher discharge pressure than you need. Because either one of those means the compressor's got to do more work, right? And so if we drop our suction line pressure by even a small fraction, that impacts the ratio uh, more greatly than even a significant increase in head pressure generally does. And especially in refrigeration, because in refrigeration, we run very low suction pressures. Those pressures are, are low to begin with. So even something like a one PSI drop can be a significant percentage change, which means that your compressor runs harder and gets hotter. 
um, and you don't move as much refrigerant because again, whenever you drop the pressure on your starting line, an easy way to think about this is um, when the, the gas coming into your compressor, when that pressure is lower, the gas is lighter. It stands to reason, right? If you have less pressure on it, there's less molecules packed together, so the gas is lighter. So for every rotation of that compressor or orbit of the scroll, it's gonna move less gas. If there's less stuff there, it's gonna move less of it. Not only that, because these are refrigerant cooled compressors in almost every case, what we work on, if the, if the gas is less dense coming into that compressor, it's not gonna be able to cool the compressor as well uh, also. So all of this to say, that's the reason why we don't like suction line dryers to be in. Um, and if we do have them in, we want them to be the lowest possible resistance. We don't want them getting dirty. We don't wanna put in really Mac Daddy restrictive suction line dryers any longer than we need to. So for those of you who have worked in the trades for a while and you're like, why do we, you know, why do we cut them out in the case of like residential systems? Or if you work in grocery stores, why do we replace these uh, burnout dryers and go back to replace them with the more simple ones later on? Or why do we pull them out completely? That's the reason why. We don't want to have additional pressure drop in the suction line. Whereas something like the liquid line where the gas is already very dense, it's under higher pressure. It's not nearly as much of a consideration. It's not going to be uh, a big impact on our compression ratio, if any at all, in most cases. Can I add something, Brian? Yeah, go ahead. So for anybody who's looking to get into re commercial refrigeration, the beginning of the job we go and we put in such or filters, I would recommend, it says in the scope that you're only supposed to put them in the beginning and take them out at the end of the job, but definitely check on them after about two weeks because those racks aren't serviced as much as we service our racks. And those filters can get really dirty really fast and it can cause a lot of problems and unnecessary service calls. Yeah. So to the to kind of the point of what Christian's saying, um, there's a lot of reasons why, especially when you're doing, you know, it's, it's some sort of major work on a on a site, why you're gonna see these suction line dryers start to start to plug up. And a lot of it has to do with uh, if compressors have been running hot for a, a long time, the oil can get really kind of gummed up and messed up. Um and then another reason is if people, when they originally uh, piped the store, if they didn't flow nitrogen when they brazed, you're going to have all this carbon throughout the throughout the system. And especially when you do a retrofit or an oil retrofit, which we're not doing as many of those as we used to, but when you go from mineral oil to POE oil, um, that POE oil is much more of a solvent than the mineral oil is. So if you had any of that cupric oxide on the inside of the tubing because they didn't flow nitrogen while brazing, all of a sudden that's all going to start coming. And anybody who's done a, a retrofit from mineral oil to poe on, on old racks you know you see that you get all this carbon starts to come through and that's where uh not only just changing them before and after but like christian said just you know replace it just check on them basically look at the pressure drops uh the section line dryers are always going to have some way for you to look at the pressure drop across that section line uh dryer and generally speaking and again it varies depending on the refrigerant but uh, but anytime you start to get over three psi you know like you really need to need to look at that um again anything is bad um, but the more is worse. And so, you know, just, just follow the, the specs on it. Go ahead, Bert. I'm just wondering if you guys are, uh, is there always suction line dryers on like market systems? Because we put them in maybe after certain kinds of repairs in residential, but is that something they're always there's a, there? There's always going to be a shell for them. Now, most of the time you, there shouldn't be uh, any in there. Sometimes they get left, but um, yeah, what, what, basically like the standard practice to help people know if suction line dryers are in there is uh, because they're cores, they're not just like a sweat in dryer, they have uh, springs. And so you would leave the springs for those like somewhere in the rack that's easily visible. So you would know, hey, you know, there's three suction cores or uh, shells on the rack uh, and I have two springs maybe one of these still have a suction core in them, you know, or I have three springs. Okay. Well, should be good. You know, so there should be equal amounts to whatever uh, filter dryer or however many uh, uh, suction line dryers shells there are. Uh, so if you don't see them, definitely it's, it raises red flags immediately. Also, as and, Brian said, uh, if you have any question about them, instead of taking everything apart, check your pressure drop across the canister. Yeah. And it also doesn't even take that long to, to pump down that header and, and pull them in it, you know, so it's not like a, a huge ordeal, but uh, it's significantly less work to pull a suction line dryer on a rack than it is to cut it out on a, uh, on most racks than to cut it out on, a, you know, a, a commercial air conditioner or even a residential air conditioner. So, 
It's just bolt on. A uh, little side note, since we were kind of talking about pressure drops and a little bit about oil. Now, I don't know if this is a slide, but like, like on a rack oil system, uh, the oil separator, you want a pressure drop, but not more than the manufacturer recommendation. I think like Westermeyer, I think it's like, yeah, like five PSI is what you should have. If it's more than that, obviously you need to check it. I think Temperite is, uh, I think it, yeah, I think it was Temperite is you, right? Temperite is you replace it with Westermeyer. <laughs> <laughs> Our friends at Westermeyer like to hear that. Um, but again, that's on the, your oil separators on the discharge line. So, yeah. uh, Pressure drops on the discharge line aren't nearly as big of a deal as pressure drops on the suction line, just because of the of the ratio. So, for example, if you think about, you know, let's say your let's say your suction pressure is I don't know, I'm just going to make up a number. Let's say your suction pressure is 10 psi, right? And you have a one psi pressure drop. That's a that's a one that's a 10 to one ratio, right? If you have a uh, you know 200 psi and you have a one psi pressure drop, that's a significantly lower ratio fraction, and so you can afford pressure drops on your discharge line and your liquid line that you can never afford uh, on your suction line. And so that's just a, just a good thing to remember. Um, and again, to, to, I think I, I really like what Christian said uh, to, uh, once again, it went in doubt, just check the pressure drop across your suction line drives, even in residential. If you don't have a pressure drop, it doesn't matter. People will often say, well, you got to pull those suction drives out. You got to pull those suction drives out. No, you, you pull them out if they have a pressure drop. That's, that's when you need to pull them out. If they don't have a pressure drop, don't worry about it. It's not going to hurt anything. It's all about that pressure drop. Well, not even uh, suction filters, but like your your line dryers as well. Always check those. It doesn't hurt. Yeah, for sure. And in the case of residential, you don't have pressure taps across your liquid line, so you you can't necessarily check it. But that's where you check for temperature drop. Um, so on liquid on the liquid line uh, filter dryers, you have that advantage because if there is a pressure drop, um, you're generally if it's bad enough, you're going to see a temperature drop. Now again, with liquid, it gets tricky though. Uh, because if it is, if it remains fully liquid and you haven't eaten up all your subcooling, you won't necessarily see a temperature drop across the liquid line filter dryer. So not every restriction across the liquid line dryer is going to show up in terms of temperature drop. Bert's laughing because I got into a fight with Joe Shearer about this and uh, I was wrong and Joe Shearer was right. I wasn't fully wrong though. And I, we're not going to explain that here. It's fine. Uh, but I can admit, I can admit uh, Joe's smarter than me. It's fine. I I, uh, I know we got we got to move on, but real quick, uh, I was uh, coming from air conditioning to refrigeration, especially. Uh, I was always used to just doing temperature drop because it's faster, more efficient. However, um, I quickly learned that you can have like as little as maybe like a one degree drop across a differential or uh, differential across a dryer, specifically a liquid line dryer, but your pressure drop across that can be ten. 12 PSI sometimes, I mean, like ridiculous amounts. And uh, it's just, so, so when, it, if you have access to put pressure ports, um, you know, or if you have the ability to, to take the pressure readings, I would always take a pressure reading over a temperature reading. Temperatures are fine if that's all you got, but always pressure. That is more reliable way to tell. So that's all I want to say about that. Yep, that's, that's true. Um, and then, uh, oh, and also to point out on a suction line dryer, temperature is not going to do you any good. Um, so that's, it's, you got to use pressure. Yep. Um, accumulators, uh, I don't know that we see very many accumulators in refrigeration in rack refrigeration. Uh, yes, ever, ever, uh, uh yeah, not older one. On your smaller one. Smaller refrigeration units. Yeah. But you, you're going to see a lot of accumulators out there on air conditioning. And like, like uh, Carrie mentioned on some uh, refrigeration units and an accumulator's job is basically to catch any liquid refrigerant before it makes it to the compressor. Um, that's its job. And so it's got this YouTube in it and um, it's going to, you know, it would have to be super full of liquid before that would ever come back. And so it just allows that system to sort of manage some liquid coming down the suction line. Now that's not the design. We don't want liquid coming down the suction line, but there's some reasons that can happen especially on things like heat pumps and air conditioning where you don't have control of that um, evaporator temperature because you're the evaporator is goes outside in a heat pump what was the artist formerly known as the condenser coil becomes the evaporator coil in heat mode and you have this really low temperature uh, space outside and so sometimes you will get some liquid that's coming back especially with fixed surface metering devices which some people still use and so uh, that's what that's that but but the thing to, to realize about accumulators is they can cause you a lot of heartache because um, the oil also needs to get pulled back 
uh, to the compressor. And so we're kind of relying on that oil settling down into the bottom and getting picked up by an orifice uh, down at the bottom uh, of that tube. Because as that oil travels back, because you know a little bit of oil circulated through the system at all times, we can't let that just get trapped in the bottom of the accumulator. So it has a screen and an orifice down to the bottom that picks up that oil and brings it back to the compressor. If that screen gets plugged or if that orphan get, orifice gets blocked for any reason, that compressor is eventually going to starve for oil and die. And the problem is a lot of technicians don't think about that. So whenever you're working with a system that has a compressor failure and you can replace the accumulator easily and inexpensively, I generally recommend just doing that. Um, otherwise, you want to empty it and uh, and clear it out. Now, again, it's a good idea to empty it anyway, because if you empty it and like, very little oil comes out, well, then it's probably safe. But again, when you're going to diagnose it, you're not going to be like, all right, you got a bad compressor, time to empty the accumulator. You know, like that's <laughs> that's not going to be a normal practice. So that's why it's it's better to cut it out. To, to, yeah. <laughs> Part of our standard protocol is every time we find a failed compressor, we just cut out that accumulator immediately. Um, I mean, it wouldn't be a terrible idea, but it's not something anybody does that I'm aware of. So just some things to know about that. We are getting pretty technical here, far more technical than we would have gotten if we didn't have a bunch of, of me feeling like I, I've got to make it a little bit more interesting. All right, motor rooms. Corey, what are, your, what are some of your uh, top motor room uh, pointers? So ear protection is crucial. Uh, that's the number one thing that, uh, especially people who aren't used to the noise already, are going to and when i mean use the noise i mean the people whose hearing hasn't been damaged by the noise already to where it's not that bad um they are loud so uh headphones uh that are semi or fully noise canceling or earplugs are a must um there is a lot of things that look scary so if you don't know what you're looking at ask before you touch but um you know just it's it's not as uh intimid it's intimidating but it's not as scary when you break down the racks I, even to this day i mean you know i'm not the greatest refrigeration guy in the world but i still try to break down racks uh especially ones that i'm not 100 percent familiar with into little pieces uh as far as instead of looking at the entire motor room saying oh my god you know there's all these pipes and wires and everything like that I say okay well you know what just like in air conditioning you know it's it's all the same stuff, more or less. Um, so, you know, break it down. Like, this is for your oil. This is your compressor. This is your breaker. This is your lines. And then trace out lines, um, you know, to see what goes where. Because, uh, you know, you're always going to have in, in a DX rack, you know, for uh, regular refrigeration. You're always going to have your suction line. You're going to have your discharge line. You're going to, the, the, refriger, the refrigeration cycle never changes. So especially if people coming from air conditioning to refrigeration, um, I, I always find it helpful to try to find uh, common ground between the two. And it makes it, uh, in my opinion, at least just a lot easier to not get overwhelmed by everything in a motor room, particularly. All right, Chad, you got any top motor room top tips? The engineers, there are some motor rooms where uh, you, know, you have to be pretty small to kind of get behind the compressors because they kind of push them against the wall. So sometimes it's it's a tight fit. So just be aware of that. Um, but I think Corey pretty much explained it pretty well. Uh, you know, it's, they're loud. I do want to point out because uh, I, I just read the safety considerations on the bottom where it says exit the motor room in case of refrigerant leak. That's actually very good. Um, but one of the things that you want to make sure too is that uh, all or all of ones I've seen at least will have exhaust fans um, keeping fresh air in. So on the right of that picture, uh, that's like your intake for fresh air. That's important to keep the motor room cool, but it's also important uh for ventilation and stuff like that you don't want to ever have uh it, it's an overlooked thing and you know people are like ah it's just an exhaust fan but those are actually really important for safety as well as the health of the rack to always make sure that your exhaust fans are running and if they aren't running uh it, it needs to be more common to make that more of a priority to figure out why and, and repair those because in case of uh a refrigerant leak that's gone undetected there are refrigerant leak detectors at the racks usually with varying accuracies uh most uh, i'll be honest with you i hardly ever look at those but um if there was a refrigerant leak and there was a high concentration of refrigerant in there 
it's particularly when you start getting into more dangerous refrigerants like CO2, you want to be very mindful of that. And that's with anything, walk-ins, motor rooms, you know, you want to always make sure that you leave yourself plenty of ventilation. I was going to say one of the best things to do when you're going into a motor room, especially if it's a new store of yours, pull out your leak detector and look for things that just don't look right. If you see oil on the ground, investigate it. If you see a part hanging, hanging somewhere, even if you don't know what it does, ask someone, try to figure out what's going on. If it's supposed to be like that, go ahead and leak search everywhere. Make sure you don't have any refrigerant leaks. Um, just try to control the things that you can control. On the thing with safety, uh, you know, it's not all laid out there, but just kind of like a rule of thumb that I like to go by is uh, any copper line in the motor room that's not insulated, just imagine it's hot. Don't touch it. <laughs> no, uh, no imagination. It is hot. Chad has hot. all the marks to prove it, too. Yeah, I've got a scar on my arm myself. Again, I keep I keep uh, giving too much props to Christian, but I, I really do like the look investigate anything that looks looks suspicious in terms of oil. Um, anytime you see any oil anywhere, always investigate it. Um, anything that looks like it could be leaking, always investigate it. Making sure that you're leak free and clean in your motor rooms. I would also say, again, this presentation is kind of more for basics. People who really maybe even shouldn't even be in the motor room. Kind of some things to make sure you know. But if you're a technician who's responsible for a motor room, one of the best things you can do is just keep everything really clean because then you can see if anything's changed uh, much more easily. If you if you leave everything oily and messy as it is, um, then it's hard for you to tell when a leak is developing. Um, it's more difficult to notice. All right, I'm going to go through some basics here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Um, when, we, when we talk about open front bunker and glass door refrigerated cases, that's that's the bulk of what we uh, what we work with inside of a inside of a grocery store. And really, what these are is their their ways of displaying product, but they contain um, your metering device. Um, they contain your evaporator coil. They uh, often contain you know your whatever your mechanism is for defrost and they have uh, a fan or a set of fans that then circulate that air parallel rack systems when we say parallel rack we're just talking about um you're allowing multiple evaporator coils out on the floor to utilize multiple compressors that are mounted on a rack so when we say a rack that's what we're talking about the the frame that all of this is mounted on uh, that also in generally include the controls and a lot of the uh, electrical um as well as the oil management system um allowing multiple uh, multiple different systems out on the floor, multiple different evaporator coils or cases out on the floor to kind of share uh, that capacity that those compressors are producing. Uh, obviously, ice machines. We don't need to say what an ice machine does because I think it's pretty clear. Um, we have these uh, oil return systems, which is a really big, uh, or oil oil management system, sort of you want to call it. This is a really big part of rack refrigeration or really big HVAC systems that you don't deal with in the smaller world. In the smaller world, you don't have access to it. It's just, it's just kind of like circling uh, through the system. But when you have these large distributed systems with a lot of piping um, and a lot of different evaporator coils, getting that oil back can be very difficult so as much as possible we want to keep that oil there with the compressors and that's where we utilize oil separators to kind of keep that oil from even leaving the rack in the first place um is, is just as little as possible we want to make sure it stays in that in that rack um and then we're also managing the oil in the compressors we're actually you know using oil sight glasses uh, or some sort of, uh, sometimes it's just sensors that you're utilizing but we're making sure that we're keeping that oil uh, proper in the uh in the compressors. Yeah, oil is the airflow of refrigeration. So often overlooked, often misunderstood, but when you get down to it, it's not as scary as it looks. Um, I Oils repairs, as long as it's not at night, are my favorite repairs. Um, it's the sexiest part of refrigeration, in my opinion. Most people hate it. I love it. Um, you can really get in depth with it, and it's surprising how how easy it is to overlook things, but how simple it all is. It's it's all a it's all science. So get good at oil, and you it, you will be much better off. Uh, just like if, in air conditioning, if you learn oil or if you learn airflow and understand airflow um, very early on, your career is going to be a lot easier. Makeup air units. Um, see a lot of these. Yeah. Uh, these basically replace exhausted air. So when you have um, kitchens or anything like that where you're exhausting a lot of air, you're, you're pushing a lot of air out, you have hoods, whatever, um, you have to replace that air in the space, otherwise the space is gonna go on negative pressure. So we actually talked about this recently 
um, restaurant that I go to a lot. I, I, I always has like this awful smell in the bathrooms and I noticed that the doors were really hard to open. So I didn't have to use any fancy tools. I just, you know, bathroom smells really bad. Doors are hard to open. Um, so I let the owner know. I'm like, well, what's what's happening is, is your your floor drains are drying out. And so when your floor drains dry out, it sucks sewer gas back up or wherever the, that floor drains discharging, which is likely somewhere nasty. And it's making the bathroom smell terrible. Um, he just kept putting different like Glade plugins all over the place thinking that would solve it. And uh, it was just because he didn't have enough makeup air. So you got to match that air coming back into the air leaving. And that's what makeup air is for. Um, in many cases, you know, uh, for years, uh, makeup air was literally just drawing outside air and dumping it in, but outside air is unconditioned. So you're not dehumidifying it. You're not cooling it. Um, often you're hardly even filtering it. Um, nowadays, there's a lot more requirements to actually condition that air before you bring it in, um, into kitchens and all that, which is a, a reason why for a really long time, there's a lot of condensation issues in, in restaurants and you'd see the, around the vents, there'd be sweating and there'd be all these, all these issues because you're bringing in all this unconditioned air. Uh, and then HVAC rooftop units are really common. I think it's probably more common in our market than maybe other places just because our outside conditions are pretty reasonable generally. You don't get a lot of stuff. Um, and so uh, RTUs are really common in our in our market. Um, some, some things that you uh, will see uh, uh, kind of uncommonly, but from time to time, um, you'll see economizers. An economizer is a system that basically uses outdoor air as a first stage of cooling in cases where the outdoor air temperature is lower than what the indoor air temperature is, which can happen pretty often when you have commercial spaces that are generating a lot of internal heat. Um, so you can kind of use that at times. And then we do see in grocery stores quite often um, reheat. And so that reheat comes in from um, uh, often the refrigeration equipment, the rack, um, you're bringing in that heat and uh, running it through a coil in order to reheat past the evaporator coil in order to make the system act as a better dehumidifier. Because sometimes you need more humidity removal, but you don't need as much cooling capacity. And so you run the air over an evaporator coil, which drops the moisture, and then you reheat it again. So that way you're not overcooling the space. It allows you to keep running the air conditioner, uh, even in times when you don't necessarily need more cooling capacity. All right, so now we're at controls. I'm not going to talk here. I just we got some things listed here. Um, I'm going to let whoever wants to whoever wants to talk about this uh, take it. I, um, all right, so let me look at this picture here. All right, so in this particular um, photo, it looks like there. It, it looks very compact and very confusing, but basically, there's just several different controls. Um, and again, we're talking about the basics uh, for supermarkets. So first off, your temperature controls, your EPR sort valves. EPR is evaporator pressure regulator. Um, since this is a parallel rack system, you have multiple compressors that are sharing a common suction and discharge line and maintaining a set uh, suction saturation temperature or set suction pressure. Um, now, an evaporator pressure regulator's job is uh, to regulate the pressure on the evaporator. So each circuit usually will have some sort of evaporator pressure regulator, uh, whether it be a SORIT, um, a CDS valve, you don't have to worry about um, what type they are right now. They're just, diff they all do the same thing. It's different, different ways to skin a cow. Is that what they say? Uh, skin a cat? Yeah, that would be a cat. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, cow, cat, whatever. But um, yeah, so you have your evaporator pressure regulators. Your low pressure controls are, I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. Low pressure. Um, if it gets too low, it will uh, cut in or cut out. Excuse me. Uh, and I'll let you guys take it. The three-way valve. When I say a three-way valve, it's similar to a reversing valve, um, but instead of shifting it to let's say heat uh it is redirecting discharge gas for a separate purpose uh usually a reclaim uh to a water heater or an air conditioner for uh reclaim dehumidification um if uh, anybody else wants to take constant cutting control defrost control electrical control whatever or whatever else all right here we go evaporators um so I, I kind of want to clarify uh, what these things tell us. So when superheat tells us uh, about feeding issues, it says charge issues here, but how well are we feeding this evaporator coil? Are we feeding it with enough refrigerant? So low superheat or less than five degrees Fahrenheit means that you're flooding it. So you're overfeeding it. 
we say overcharged likely, these are in cases of systems that don't have receivers and where you only have a one-to-one -one type of configuration. But in a, in a grocery store, generally when you're overfeeding an evaporator coil, it has to do with the setting of the metering device, is that that metering device is overfeeding the evaporator coil. Um, and that's generally because you're using TXVs or electronic expansion valves. High superheat or superheat over 20 degrees Fahrenheit, and again, we're talking about at the evaporator coil or even, you know, it doesn't even have to be that high. Uh, means that it is starving, so you're not feeding enough refrigerant through. So I always talk about superheat. The easiest way to think about it in my mind is when you have low, lower the superheat, the more full the evaporative coil is of boiling refrigerant. When you have higher superheat, that evaporative coil is less full of boiling refrigerant. And that is actually very, that that is what's happening. Um, and so we want that evaporative coil to be nice and full. We want to have a low enough superheat, but it needs to be low enough that it's, it needs to be high enough that it's under control. Jamie Kitchen from Danfoss, um, taught me this term in a podcast a, a long time ago of minimum stable superheat, which means that we want our superheat to be as low as we can possibly stably keep it, which is where electronic expansion valves have an advantage because they don't become unstable um, until a lower superheat than uh, thermostatic expansion valves do. Thermostatic expansion valves, as you start to get kind of, at least your typical ones, you start to get a, below about six degrees of superheat, they start to get unstable. You start to get hunting and all this, which is why if you get a case where you are getting hunting um, or you're getting like kind of intermittent uh, floodback, then just increasing your superheat a little bit sometimes can stabilize everything out. And then high temperature in the refrigerated space. So we, we would say, you know, it's not making temp, um, dirty or frozen uh, coils, low airflow. On a externally equalized TXVs that are in some of the most of the cases I've seen, they'll have screens in them that you can replace. If you don't have to unsweat anything, it's just all, it's all right there. You can check that screen of where your inlet of the refrigerant's going. If that's all blocked up, it's going to cause you know high superheat. And uh, like newer cases as well. Um, not always are they shipped with the right cartridge size, which is just, you know, the different size orifice for, you know, how many BTUs you're trying to make with that case. So usually I just call them and let them know what I'm using the case for. And the manufacturer will let you know, like, what size orifice you need to appropriately get that case set to how it should run. Yeah, which is another key point for anybody who is used to air conditioning. We talk about replacing valves. Well, in, in uh, market refrigeration, at the very worst, you're swapping a screen or cleaning a screen and maybe replacing a cartridge if it's the wrong one or the cartridge is messed up in some way, the internals. Um, so you basically have the screen and you have the guts. Those are the two things you're going to potentially uh, replace or change on a valve if, if you have the wrong ones. You're not replacing the valve itself, which is kind of kind of nice. Um, the not nice and, thing is, is that because they're longer piping and there's just more that can go wrong, the screens do plug up more. Yeah, or the power head. But, well, power yeah, heads, that, you know, good point. Two most common things you're going to run into with the expansion valves are obviously a dirty screen. Uh, that's going to be your by far your most common. But the second most common in my experience is a uh, is a stripped out uh, stem adjustment stem. So people will have superheat issues. They will crank on that thing till they can't anymore. As soon as you feel any resistance, like stop, because I can't tell you, I literally, I should, I should have taken a picture. I have a bin in my truck of stripped out stems and Sporlin, if you're using Sporlin valves, they have a part number where you can actually get those. Uh, but yeah, over adjusted stems are horrible because they will get stuck. They always get stuck all the way closed or all the way open, depending on what somebody was trying to do with them. So if they were trying to close it all the way and they over adjusted, it, it's going to get stuck closed. If they ever um, try to open it all the way and they open it too much, it's going to get stuck open and you're just going to flood all the time. So those are the two most common I've seen. Or the, uh, the push rods that are seized up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Push rods too. Yeah. yeah I, I think that has a little bit to do also with, you know, the over adjusting and all that too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Warland um, has a nice kit. Uh, that comes with push rods. You got all your cartridge sizes and a nice little bottle of oil. So like, it is always important to just always oil everything when, if you're rebuilding a valve. There's also valves from breaking is you will feel them. Flip. And if you're having issues with not getting proper superheat 
or it's not feeding properly, don't try to push that valve or you have some some other sort of feed problem. And I've seen people saying, well, maybe I just open it there, you know, two turns or so, I'll get a little bit more super heat out or less super heat out of it. Um, it's the case of you know, you're just putting a break in the valve and then it's an expensive part to just be replacing willy nilly. All right. So uh, compressors, um, you know, anything that is uh, out of the ordinary in terms of noise or, or um, you know, shaking around, uh, that, that's what you have to pay attention for. And then also another good thing to pay attention for is um, high discharge temperatures. I, I like the idea. I've taken um, thermal imaging cameras into motor rooms before, and you can actually do a lot of comparison there. Now, obviously, they all have to be on uh, and at full capacity. Uh, but you can kind of comparing one to another is one handy thing in a rack room. It gives you that context, um, but you want to pay attention to that. And then obviously slugging uh, or flood back. Um, so flood back is just, just means that it's that liquid refrigerant is making it back to the compressor. Slugging means that liquid refrigerant is actually making it into the cylinders or into the compression chamber. So if it's actually making it uh, into the, into the space where it's truly being compressed, that's when massive damage uh, can occur. And, kind of blow everything apart yeah compressor superheat uh, and discharge temperatures are very overlooked when you're just doing regular preventative maintenance service calls um, or uh, anything for that matter uh, each manufacturer of compressors i don't care what it is they all have a factory recommended uh, compressor superheat to make sure that that compressor is staying nice and cool. Copeland, I know, prefers like 20 to 30 degrees of compressor superheat um, and measuring it. Uh, I think they want like 10 inches or something from the from the compressor. I don't, I don't know. But um, yeah, so compressor superheat is uh, vitally important and discharge temperatures as well. You, you can't really use a thermal imager to see discharge temperatures like line temperatures because of the copper, but uh, you, you got to put like tape or something on it. I don't know, but uh, a regular pipe clamp or thermocouple uh, it works just as well. And uh, again, Copeland and really anything, it's pretty universal. I mean, you don't want anything over 225 degrees. I mean, once you get 200, over 225 degrees discharge line temp, uh, you're, you're going to start cooking that oil, which is going to lead to massive problems with both the compressor and the rack itself. If you've made a, some sort of alteration, especially something at the case level, and now all of a sudden you're getting flood back, go and look at what you just did. Because if your valve is wide open um, or something else is going on, some, something's going on where liquid refrigerant's just flying through that evaporator coil, um, you need to rectify that. Um, because again, this flood back happens because of something that's going on at the case level in rack refrigeration. So figure out which one's which one's causing it. And it's most likely the one you just worked on if it was working fine before and now you're having now you're having an issue. To the point of, uh, yeah, I, I like what Corey had to say about checking discharge temperatures. It is true that when you are uh, checking the actual discharge line temperature with a thermal imaging camera it doesn't work because of the emissivity of the copper tubing. Uh, but you can still tend to, you can still compare like compressor to compressor on the actual heads and all that, uh, mm -hmm. even the oil pumps and all that. You, you can get a good sense of if you have an outlier in terms of um, high temperature. But it's critical to understand that in rack refrigeration, because you have multiple compressors sharing the same oil, uh, it's really dangerous to have um, issues, to allow issues to occur that can break down that oil because, or, or, cause, or cause damage, because now that can get shared among multiple compressors and really cause a catastrophic situation. So it's another reason why it's really important to do maintenance and keep an eye on all these things, make sure you're tending to oil, make sure you're not slugging or flooding, um, just making sure you're keeping that all, uh, all in check. I was just going to add to uh, uh, starting up new cases. If uh, like if you're starting up a new case, or if you just replace an expansion valve on a case, and you're not a good a good starting point is to kind of fill your fill your valve out. I usually, which we deal with spoiling valves more than anything, and it's like I think it's four and a quarter or four and a half turns, full turns. It's going to put your valve like right in the middle, and that's usually a good starting point. Not always, but typically that's a pretty good starting point to prevent, you know, immediate flood back. I don't know if I should get into it, but another good thing to, to keep in mind about flood back too is it doesn't necessarily need to be just uh, at the, it is at the case level, but in, a, in the event of like a wreck that has been down for any prolonged period of time, you're going to 
have the potential when you start that rack up of massive flood back. So you have incredible load, heat load on your uh, on your rack when you have multiple circuits all warm and you just kick on all the compressors. Uh, so to negate that, you would any anytime you have a rack down, like I said, for any prolonged period of time, you're going to want to valve off the suction lines to uh, those racks and kick everything on very nice and slow. You don't want to go, you know, Tesla super speed mode, zero to 60, you know, reset all the oil and kick it on because you will take out a compressor, guaranteed. Um, it's very easy to do. Well, you do your oil reservoir. Or are you going to wash your oil out? Well, yeah, yeah, that's why that's what I'm saying is you're, you, you take all, you're going to valve off your oil reservoir, but, um, you know, the circuits and kick one compressor on, valve, put, it, put a valve on the suction lines and just meter nice and slow all the circuits, off, you know, gradually on as well as the compressors. And then, yeah, like Chad said, the oil uh, that's been sitting in the bottom of the separator, it's going to, it's cold. Uh, it's going to be high pressure and, you know, open it up, let it flow a little bit, close it, and you can feel the lines, how cold they are. It might be saying it's on, like, but uh, you feel the head of your compressors. Like, if they're not warm or, like, hot, like, it's not running. And then also a good thing to check, too, to make where you can see if you're not, like, bleeding by a discharge gas through your suction side, you can feel the bell and each compressor they should be cool sweating if they're warm and it's running then you got an issue and that will also increase your suction pressure which is not going to help out your cases or really anything normally if you feel your suction bell head is warm this picture is a good description of it you usually have a bad valve what were you going to say, Kerry? Oh, I was just going to add to, uh, if you come to a rack and you really, and it's not running at all, and you're not sure how long it's been down, I mean, probably the safest thing to do is, is to go back to the truck, grab the recovery machine, and try to get the liquid, you know, like Corey said, valve off your suction, going back to your case, or coming from your cases, and pump, pump that liquid into the liquid line and just so that you you know and then slowly valve, valve your cases back on you know turn the compressor on slowly valve those cases back on so you know for sure there's not any liquid or any chance of liquid getting back to that rack when you're starting it up this is what happens to your valve these this is from a 60 compressor uh that i pulled the heads on wednesday uh if you notice all that right uh sorry i'm flicking everybody off but if you notice like all that right here these are uh your discharge uh pucks or valves whatever you want to call them reeds uh and they're all blown out so it's it's bypassing that's that's no good liquid was on the head it was started up at some point and liquid does not compress and that's your end result uh and your pistons are all bent too as carrie said Making sure that when you go to start up a rack, it's not for a long time. Making sure that there's not liquid in those compressors. Uh, if you're not sure, you, you need you need to make sure because you will kill all those compressors almost instantaneously trying to just shove them on with uh, being full of liquid like that. I might have done that before a couple times. Me too. Me too. Bad, <laughs> bad always do one, one compressor at a time. Oh yeah, for One sure. Run yeah. for about you know and two three next minutes and turn it, and then, uh, and then the next one. Especially, especially, especially on bitters. Bitters do not yeah. like liquid yep. at all. Yeah, bitters are the worst with that. I mean, any about fall back they cannot tolerate. Thank you guys uh, for taking the time to do this, and uh, we will we will follow up and wrap this one up. I do appreciate the engagement. I kind of like doing it this way. It's 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 fun. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. 
You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.